All right, now, so we were looking at searching using different criteria, and at the very end I showed you this kind of search, which you should make a note of that this is the long tail keyword. This is a keyword search based on the long tail. Let me explain what the long tail is. I'm actually going to draw it. Out my tool right here. I'm going to try. So I'm going to try out this pen thing that I never use, and we'll see how this goes. Okay. So um, I have here x and y axes. Over here on the bottom is the keyword, and on the left side is the frequency. And so the theory goes the theory goes that if we draw a line that looks something like this this is the this is the long tail there are keywords along this axis that are used a lot and some that are used a little so there's some keywords right here. Web designer used a lot. So you're not going to get found by you by that keyword, web designer. But down over here, maybe there's web designer, restaurant web designers in San Diego. Less people are using that, so you could be found more. That's the basic idea here. So let me write this is the long tail keyword strategy. long tail keyword strategy. I'm going to save this into my network folder before the end of the day. I'm going to give you this and a couple of other items. But here's the but here's the concept in general. You're not going to get very much very many results by trying to use keywords and everyone else is using. You can get better results using keywords that less people are using. So not Italian food, but authentic Italian food in Chula Vista. Something as basic as that. Something that you're probably already doing yourself when you're searching for stuff. How to fix if loop in JavaScript. When I'm looking for stuff like that, I'm specific. I want to look I want to find that answer. So I'm specific. I'm not going to just look up if loop that's going to give me so many results that are not going to be what I want. I'm looking for fixing if loop in JavaScript, because there's if loops in JavaScript. PHP, uh, C++, every programming language has that kind of loop. But I care about the JavaScript version of the loop and how to fix a problem that I'm having with the counter. How to fix counter in if loop JavaScript. That's how I would search for that. And again, I'm down over here, the long tail. Because think of this as the tail. Or the back end of a cow. See, it comes over here, there's the tail. So this is the long tail keyword. This is what we're going to focus on a lot in this class, in that we need to optimize our site to use long tail keywords. This is where everyone is going to vary a little bit, because obviously your company has certain keywords, and your company has certain keywords, and your company has certain keywords. But the concept is basically this, that we um, we need to find these. How many of them? Well, as many as are relevant. I'm not going to say, make sure you've got five keywords, make sure you've got 12, 20, 40, as many as, as necessary that define the concept of your site or your online presence in total. If I'm a web design company, some of the keywords will be web design, maybe restaurant web design, maybe social media for restaurants, maybe Twitter setup for San Diego restaurants. All of those things relate. They're all related to web design, web marketing and such. So all of those and many more are going to be part of my keyword strategy. 
we're going to have an activity right now where we think about these things, perhaps write some of these things. Once we've um, gotten this sort of list, then we're going to start to apply it to our website. Again, if you don't have a website, you can just follow along, and when you do have one, apply it. But the long tail keyword strategy is the modern way to do things, because in the old days of the search engines, the tactic was you developed your keywords, web design, let's say. In web design, I'm going to put it on my home page, and my about, about page, and my contact page, and the first paragraph of every page, and my keywords and meta tags and everything. I'm going to put that keyword everywhere. That was the old way. That was the way, the only way the old ancient search engines knew how to understand your site. Get those keywords all over your site. But if you can do that, so can your competitor. And so can the spammers. So every technique of SEO that used to work, eventually, is corrupted by the spammers. And therefore, then the search engines change the criteria. So nowadays it's not simply that you've got these meta tags, these keywords, and you're adding web design and San Diego to your site. You're being more specific and you're being smarter about it, as we'll talk about it during the class. Because this is a, this is a moving target. SEO is a moving target. And I try to always teach the latest techniques because I don't want you to use the wrong techniques, the outdated techniques, the techniques that actually might hurt you now. Unfortunately, nowadays the search engines are a bit more of um, guilty until proven innocent instead of innocent until proven guilty. They're a bit more of shoot first, ask questions later. They're a bit more of guilty by association. If you are doing things that make you seem like a spammer, even though you're not a spammer, and I believe you, the search engines won't. They're going to see that you're doing these things that spammers do, and they're going to say this is a spammer. You're going to be in a, in a hole of negative SEO that you're going to need to climb out of. So that's why I try to always talk about the latest techniques, and they're always changing. One of the things that's relatively new that you should make a note of that we'll talk about more in detail is, is your site mobile friendly? We'll talk about what that means, but ask yourself that. Is your site mobile friendly? If it's not, that could be a detriment. If you don't know what that means, we'll talk about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a new document and my graphic of the long tail. I'm going to remind you where the network folder is at, whatever you're doing. If you can minimize everything, go to the desktop and then uh, open computer at the top left again. You might have closed it so you can open computer again. And we've got the network location, drive Z. Data network location. Then my folder is Campos SEO. Double click that. And now there's two files for you this graphic of the long tail I just drew and the client company profile. Drag both of them to your desktop. Don't double click them, drag them to your desktop or your flash drive. If you brought a flash drive, plug it in and copy these files. If you didn't bring one, you can email it to yourself. But copy the, both of those, so you, just so you can have the drawing if you'd like. And then we'll look at client company profile. That's a Word document that you can open up, and you can print it later when I turn on the printer. But I don't recommend you print it, because it is a, it is a Word document that you can edit. I would recommend you actually you know, edit it, as I'll explain what this is in a moment and how to use it. As I've said earlier, when my company meets with a potential client, we can offer many services. We can run their social media. We can uh, help them with their SEO needs. Uh, we can build them a website, everything, uh, write their text, and so forth. Um, in order for us to be able to be effective, effective mouthpieces for any company, then we need to know about the company. The best people that know about the company are the people that work in it, the owners of it, etc. But we now would have to also know everything that we can about the company to be effective for the company. And so this is one of the things that we engage in with a client. This is a variation on one of the things that we do for a client early on to better understand what the client is, what they need, and how we can fulfill their needs. 
So you don't have to fill this out and turn it in. I'm not going to give you any grade. There's no grade in this class. There's no assignments. There's no certificate that you get at the end. Hopefully what you get out of it are tangible things that you can apply to all your online endeavors. If you'd like me to look this over, we can look at it during the, the lab time or you can email it to me or whatever, but this is not something you're going to turn in. You're going to put your company name, this is the company profile, and your name and the date, because this can change. And basically this is an exercise for you to understand for yourself as much as you can about your company, or for me, as my company, PMB Interactive, to understand about your company if you were hiring us. So these are questions that you need to ask yourself or interested parties of the company, the founder, the co-founder, the owner, the investors, whoever, even you know as far down as the employees, but again, the more people that you give the opportunity to give their opinion, the more opinions you'll get, which might not be what you want. You want the people that can make the decisions to make the decisions. When, de when we deal with companies, we always have to lay that out. Okay, who are we talking to? Who are we answering to? Who's answering our questions? Not the husband of the owner of the business, the owner of the business. So whoever is interested and invested in the company needs to think about these things, these questions. Company name. What is the name of your company? Why did you choose the name? Does it have a special meaning or story? For example, my web design company will be Vic.co, pronounced Vic.co, and it comes from my name. So you probably have a name of your company. You still want to fill this out answering some of these questions, not just simply answering Victor's web design. You want to answer, well, why did you choose that name? Actually, Victor is my grandfather's name, and he was a graphic designer at the turn of the century, so that's why I named my company Victor's Web Design, in his honor, etc., etc. The point of answering this stuff in this sort of detail is because these things will help you develop your keywords, your long-tail keywords, it will help you create content that then you will apply to your website, like the About page, for example. Every site needs an About page. If you've got a Twitter account, that has a little bio section, a biography. This is something that could be written in the biography of your Twitter, or your Facebook, or your Periscope, or whatever it is you're online, or your Yelp. So thinking about these things, having them consolidated in one document could be very useful to you. That's why I provide this for you. Tagline. Think of one sentence that helps people understand what your company is about. Think of some famous taglines. I'm loving it. It's in the game. Just do it. Why do they stick? Your tagline could also be a concise statement about your company if its name is not immediately understandable. For example, Vic.co, a great company for your great website. Taglines, of course, are an art and a science. They are best for written by people that like to write, that are good writers, that are marketers. Such a simple name like Just Do It from Nike or I'm Loving It from McDonald's, etc., etc. All the famous taglines and catchphrases. Most of the time they come from a team of marketers that spend hours to develop the perfect language to get across the message, to touch the hearts of the audience, to buy the product. So. You might not have an idea right now. You might have to think about it. You might have to change it. That's fine. You're probably not a professional marketer. That's fine. But as a business owner, you might have to wear a lot of hats. And so, again, getting feedback from the people of your company could be useful, but you don't want to give everyone the opportunity to give an opinion unless you want a lot of opinions. There's a little part to write about us information. Again, that will look great on your website or your Facebook biography or text for your billboard or whatever. Write a paragraph about your company. Who founded it? What is it about? When did you get the idea for it? Where was it founded? Why are you in this business? How will you make the company a success? These answers will help you fill your biography on various sites. And notice I did the classic who, what, when, where, why, how of journalism. So if you answer as many of those as possible, you have more content to use on your various online presences.
present presentees. Mission statement. Write something that lets potential customers know what's in it for them. Why would they hire you? For example, Vic.co exists to bring the most beautiful web design to the most discerning clients in Southern California. Our designs will make everyone take notice. Mission statement can be very difficult because it can be literal or it can be more prosaic, artistic. Um, you can get examples from just about every company's website. If you poke around on most websites, there will be somewhere, maybe in the about page, maybe in the investor page, something about a mission statement. Every company often has and usually needs a mission statement. The mission statement tells potential customers, users, followers, whatever, what they're about. Here on our college's website, right at the bottom, mission to provide ongoing learning opportunities, preparing diverse individuals for career advancement, a college education, or enriched lives through good health and personal fulfillment. So that's the mission of this college. Who are we targeting? Diverse individuals that want, what do they want? Career advancement, or an education, or enriched lives. How do we do it? Through good health and personal fulfillment. So, there's a the mission statement. The longer version is there as well. That's nice for a blurb, but then the full one is there's mission, there's philosophy, core values, mission statement, abstract, and mission statement complete, lots of bullet points, and so forth. So our college's website, if you didn't know, is sdce.edu, and it's and I bring it to your attention to take a look at their mission statement. It could give you ideas on what to write. But the reason that this is also one of the difficult ones is I've got this very, very simple word here. Why? Let me do a little segue to talk about the concept of the golden circles. This is another one that I'll draw. Golden circles. Um, I believe the author of this concept is Simon Sinek. We'll look him up in a moment. But I'm going to draw three circles. three circles that are within in each other, so concentric circles. There's an outer circle, or oval, and then there's an inner circle, and then there's the innermost circle. The outer circle is what the inner the second inner circle I'll write it over here the outer circle here is what the next circle inside is how and the innermost circle is why. I made it too small, but that's why. Those are three questions. Those are three questions for your company. Um, and this concept of the golden circles, notice how they're all related to each other, they're all inside of each other. Um, and the author, Simon Sinek, has a couple of books and lectures and such. You can look them up online and, and look up Simon Sinek. Uh, I believe it's spelled S-I-N-E-K. Simon Sinek, or maybe Sinek. I don't quite remember. Sinek or Sinek. Um, he's got various versions of, of his lectures. There's a free one over on one of the websites that you can read. But the concept here, in a very small nutshell, is the what of a company is very easy to answer. I'm a web design company. What do we do? We do web design. The how is the next level. How do we do web design? Well, we use WordPress, and we use uh, JavaScript, and we use various techniques that uh, create a website. 
the why is the hardest one. Why are we web designers? It could be, okay, we want to make money. We like to do it. We want to help people. We want to be part of the success of a company. That's the why. The why is also very important because that's how you make a connection with potential customers. <coughs> you can find many companies that have the same what, and many that have the same how, but very few that have the same why. There's many web designers out there, the what. There's many of them that use WordPress, the how. But there's very few that can answer the why. For example, one of the whys about why we do this or why we connect with customers is all the people in my company are San Diego locals. We grew up here. We went to school here. We graduated from colleges of here of San Diego. We live here. We've raised families. We, we're about San Diego. We like San Diego. Therefore, we're going to target to do companies, uh, to do websites for companies in San Diego that have a San Diego flair and personality and style. I'm connecting with companies that have a connection to San Diego as well as my company having a connection to San Diego and that's the why. That's how you make that connection with potential customers because a customer could hire a very affordable very good website out of LA, out of Portland, out of New York, out of Austin, out of Boise, anywhere. But the why of they would hire us is because we're local. We can answer the phone. We're on the same um, time zone. We grew up with the local culture. We know the best taco shops. We know when not to get on the five at the right at the wrong time. We know the local culture. That could be a why of our company of why they would hire us. Again, it's the hardest one to answer because every company is different. Every product is different. Every client is different. But if you can figure out the why and how it relates to your to your potential customers, to your demographic, you will be better off. And that's why the mission statement is a valuable thing. Why would they hire you? Yes. Simon Sinek. He has like this awesome TED talk. Exactly. I highly recommend everyone to watch. It's the second most watched TED talk globally. It talks about the the golden world. Yes, so this is the author, and I just looked him up. Ted, if you haven't heard of Ted, Ted Talks. These are these great lectures that people give on a variety of fascinating topics for free. Um, this particular one, Ted Talks, Simon Sinek, and it appears right at the top there, so you can watch his thing. See, there's why, how, and what. This is a version of it, 12 minutes. And of course, he's got a book and all of that, so. If you want to get more of that, this is uh, he goes in his in his book. Uh, I think it's called Start with Why. Uh, he gives examples of you know the Wright brothers and Apple computer and uh, Martin Luther King, and then the why are they well known? Why are they successful? Why are they influential? Why are they leaders? Love them or hate them, Apple is one of the biggest companies in humanity, not just in the U.S. in humanity. They have so much money, they have so much clout, which may or may not be waning, but they have so many profits, they have so much well-known uh, you know, clout. They didn't invent the cell phone. You could argue they perfected it. You, know, you could argue anything about what they do, but they are one of the most well-known companies. Samsung is another well-known company in, in, in cell phones, and they also do refrigerators and all of that stuff, if you didn't know. But um, I bring up Apple because that's a, that's a great example of a company that really has a very strong marketing arm. Um, marketing is an aspect of SEO, SEM, search engine marketing. This and other exercises that we'll do, mission statement and later vision statement and other things, will be aspects of marketing. Uh, how you get fame and keep customers happy and interested and so forth. So the thing about SEO is that if you're only really focused on traditional concepts of SEO keywords and meta tags and all of that, you've got less than half the picture. 
the marketing aspect is also a very important aspect of all of this, getting found online. Going on. Values. What are some keywords that your company believes in? For example, orderliness, teamwork, discipline, efficiency, creativity, and tolerance. Here's an excellent list. Click that and you can follow and see a bunch of values. The point of this is that, yes, it's a company, it's not a real person, but it's made out of people. And um, the reason that people have such an affinity for certain brands is because they have the values consciously or subconsciously that they have as well. I like um, you know, Microsoft because their core value of efficiency resonates with me. I like Samsung because their value of bringing people together resonates with me. Whatever way that a person makes a connection with a company or brand or product or thing, the personification that happens, we can take advantage of that by defining the values of the company. Honestly, of course, you're not just going to put here, our company believes in ecology, and you are you know, a company that strip mines. So you're going to think of these keywords. They could be part of your mission statement. They could be part of the about page. They could be keywords that you sprinkle in through your tweets and such. And you, that helps you reach your audience. It helps you get your traffic. personality of your company. Think of your company as a person. How would he or she communicate? How would he or she behave? For example, Vic.co's communication is spontaneous and friendly. Vic.co is happy to talk to new clients and share the latest in web design. The point of this personality is, again, another way to make the human connection. You're a faceless company to make a human connection. So if you've got a bank, if, you've got a, if you're a CPA, if you're, if you're a tax preparer, are you really, or let's say you're looking for one of those, are you really going to hire a CPA that is always tweeting weird cat pictures and using slang and all of their correspondence and all of that? You probably want a stoic, professional person to deal with your taxes. Maybe you do want that funny, irreverent, um, you know, personal trainer that puts you on ease so that then you can do your routines. So whatever personality you have here, how you communicate online, on your website, on your social media, on your press releases, etc., that is also in service to finding your audience. Because we always ask the client early on, who's your target audience? We have an activity for that later. Who's your target audience? And if the answer is everyone, that's the wrong answer. Because no, not everyone's going to care about your product. I give the example that one time uh, we met with a person. He uh, wanted us to do their website and such. And we asked him, who are you selling your product to? Who's your demographic? They said everyone. They were selling baby strollers. So no, not everyone. Parents. Well, parents between you know one and five years old of their child or whatever. So not everyone cares about that stroller. Further speaking with him, we eventually whittled it down that who he's really looking for to buy his products are first-time young Latino parents. You know, first-time parents. That's who his personality is. That's who he's going for. So his website, the text of his website and everything that he does is going to be targeting that audience, not everyone. Because if you try to reach everyone, you will, you will reach no one. And finally, fundamentals. Just here, a spot for you to list the company, website, address, etc., etc. Social media. You may also list social media profiles you would like to set up in the future. Don't write all of them. Because social media, each different social media network has its own, uh, its own user base, its own voice, its own style. And um, I'll mention, at the end of the day, the other classes I teach, I teach a social media class this Friday, 9.30 a.m. I'll mention it again later. And Tuesdays, 6 p.m. So if you've already got some time Tuesday nights, 6 p.m., or Friday mornings, 9.30 a.m., I teach a couple social media classes. But I'll mention that later. Yes? This class incorporates aspects of SEM. 
that's such a big topic in and of itself, but it's so important to SEO. They both come in together in this class. But a marketing, you can get a degree in marketing. That's such a big topic itself. Um, any questions in this document? Of this document? Okay, again, you don't need to fill this out and turn it in and, and turn it in for a grade or anything, but you can fill it out at some point and then uh, I can look it over and give you give you opinions. I'm going to change gears a little bit, so any questions on this? Okay, let me show you examples. Let me show you examples of um, real uh, clients. Just so that you can have examples of, uh, of websites. Oh, if you notice on the syllabus, if you notice on the syllabus, on the last page, or on the second to, to last page with the calendar, I have there blocked in a day an activity that mentions. On the third day, class activity, analyze my site. The last day, if you would like to volunteer, I will put up your website up on the board here. I will give you some free advice on your site in the meanest way possible to help you. And um, you can help each other with opinions and such as well. So that'll be on the last day. That's optional. If you'd like to, that's usually the last thing we do, so you can stay for that or not. And uh, it's, I think it's very helpful. I always do it in my classes, and people always learn a thing or two. They think they've got a good website, and usually they don't. And then um, right here we talk about it and how we can improve it. So that's on the last day of the class. But I will show you a, a few examples of some clients that we've worked with. Let me show you first the, the, the client that has the most full-featured contract. Um, hard to spell perhaps with aquí es texcoco.com aquí es texcoco.com they are a Mexican food restaurant they started in um, in Tijuana in 1990 they came to the US in 2008 or 9 or so and then they've opened a restaurant a little over a year ago another another location in uh, LA and then there's plans for one in Las Vegas in about a year. Uh, they've been featured on television, they've been on local TV of course, but they've been on the Travel Channel, the Cooking Channel. Rachel Ray has written about their food, Andrew, Andrew Zimmern, um, various other chefs and shows and such, all of this stuff. All of this more fame happened coincidentally after our company started to work with them so we can probably take some of the credit but this website is the most full featured client we have at the moment they basically have the whole plate of what we offer we designed their website its WordPress we designed their logo and their text and we took all their photos and designed their flyers and graphics and write their blogs and all of that set up the events so, so we do everything for them and the reason I bring this up is because notice this particular website okay there's plenty of Mexican food shops out there how many have been featured on television national television how many get uh, ratings from Zagat which is one of the the number one names in in the in the restaurant rating business how many of them get featured in a book by a Pulitzer Prize winning food critic so this website has all of the aspects of what every website should have to aspire to. At the top right, links to social media. 
because if you've only got a website remember when I did that search for my business and it pulled up all of those things if you've only got a website then the search engines can't find enough stuff about you here they're on Instagram to show off photos of the food YouTube to, sh to play videos and commercials and such about the restaurant Google Plus to reach an audience of foodies Twitter to reach out to uh, to, to future and, and past customers and Facebook because everyone needs to be on Facebook every business and there's of course many other social networks not even listed here that they're also connected with Periscope for live video and what else is there um, just so many social networks um, Yelp and Foursquare and TripAdvisor and all of that but we're not gonna have time to get into a lot of details of social media guess what I teach a class on social media two of them this has got a lot of great photos I don't teach any classes on photography and then that's kind of a complex thing to to teach but photos you always want to have original photography just because you can search on Bing or Yahoo or Google tacos and find a million great results of tacos doesn't mean you should use the pictures just because you can search anything and find hey, that'll look great on my blog no you should be using your own original content at all times as much as possible that's a part of SEO because that picture these search engines are so advanced this search and the search engine has stored that picture and everything about the picture the dimensions the metadata the pixels the file name everything so if you use that same picture on your website and that picture was on someone else's website the search engines will know and if you use a lot of repurposed content that is not your own that could penalize you so you always want to use your own original content write your own text don't rip it off from other sites create your own pictures don't rip them off from other sites or searches Every one of us could be a photographer to some degree if you've got especially a mobile device. These things nowadays take really good photos. Obviously for the best photos you need a better camera, but this thing in your pocket can take really good photos. Take photos of your products, of the people, of your content, and then you will have original content to put on your site. Yeah, question? Mm -hmm. um, Regarding using somebody else, uh, you know, photos. Mm -hmm. you know, um, what if, like, you change the colors for the size? Is, I, I know, but. The, so, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, before we are still going to use my personal use my word for power of fabric. I'm not a lawyer, but there are provisions for transformative works mm -hmm. in that you can take someone else's photo and change them to some degree I'm not a lawyer and usually those things are decided in a court of law because if you find a photo that you, is really good but you're gonna say okay, I'm gonna change the color I'm gonna change the shirt of the person I'm gonna crop it I'm gonna change it and that's like let's say you change the photo 50 percent whatever that means well then still the originator of that photo could say that's my photo mm -hmm. you say no I changed it you'll say that's let's talk to my lawyer so I mean like for example like uh, you know the logo uh, Android you mm -hmm. know Android that little green robot thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I did some kind of Android logo on my website, so I changed it to baby blue or something, for example. But, like, you have to check since that especially is a logo or perhaps trademark that's even trickier than a photo because that was something that was designed and is probably copyrighted in the US patent office and such so you have to check with the company sometimes a company somewhere on their about page or investor page might say you can change our logo like this or you can use a variation like that you know if you look up Twitter there's a section in there for the press where people where they give you a high quality copy of their of their logo like a print quality but they tell you right there don't rotate it don't change its color etc because i noticed you just there too you know for the online website because you have like the facebook uh, well, logo oh yes yeah, little icon or something these these icons up here mm -hmm. so you have like the facebook and you have like, that's that's a lot of people have 
Well, yes, they're links, but they're allowed. Uh, these these are the official logos of the company, but they're not they're not being altered. Um, you know, we're not putting the the logo of this company. We're not putting the little plant inside the Twitter bird. That would be transforming it, and the company wouldn't like that. Well, I mean, in, in, in the same way, you know, like to add the the link on my site, like for example, I have like you know, like to change. Yeah, true. They have those. They do, although officially the, the, the only official colors are blue and white. Uh, but yeah, it's a tricky thing. Uh, but I'm not. But really, about the social media, it's it's actually more permissive than, than you think. That that one's pretty okay to use their logos uh, most of the time, as long as you kind of leave them alone as much as possible. Really, what I, I would say is the is the photography and and other kinds of things like that. That's the one that's that's that could be trickier. That can get you into trouble. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're using it as in the design of your website, like you found something and you're almost using that as like a wallpaper. And, and are you saying to not use images that aren't yours because of the legal aspect or because then when it's searched, it's somehow tied to this image so it like scrambles it or something? Or is it just the legality of using someone else's picture? It's a bit of both, but it's most of the legality of it. Uh, you find a great photo and then you put it in your background and then the author says, well, why didn't you pay me for my photo? So really, uh, it's more for the legality. The SEO aspect of it is not as much of an importance as other considerations. But I know that oftentimes we, we can't always have amazing photos. So I do have this search engine, pixabay.com, that is a place for you to search for photos that are free, that are okay for you to use in your backgrounds and for prints and everything. And if you search, if you do a regular search on Bing, Google, whatever, if you search taco, but you search taco along with the keyword stock image. So here's some keywords. Stock image, or public domain, or royalty free. Or another one, this is a pretty modern one, copy left. There's copyright, there's copy left. If you use these terms, one, not all of them, but one of these at a time, taco pictures, stock image. If you search that way, it should guide you toward getting images that are safer for you to use than just anyone that shows up from a search. Ideally, you're creating your own content. That's not always possible. I go here as well. I go to Pixabay. Uh, I'll show my website, my company's website, in a little bit. And there's a blog in there that we write. Uh, sometimes we don't have time to create a brand new photo just for that blog post. I come here, I search, I find the picture, and it's safe to do because I'm searching in the right place. When you take images, when you throw them into like Photoshop or anything, whether or not you make changes and you then save it as like a Photoshop format or anything else, does it then erase the original data that was linked to it? Because then from there, you can save it as... If you, if, if you know what you're doing, you can do that. There's always ways to do just about anything online when it's digital especially that's that could be good and bad you know it's bad for me let's say I'm an artist I'm putting my photos there and then someone downloads it and puts their name on it and they stole it obviously that's the extreme example a more benign example is taking that cool background photo and changing it a little bit and they'll put it on my site and they'll never know but really I want to guide people to use as much as possible stock images public domain images free images that are the most legal for you. I'm thinking more in terms of legality rather than SEO, <coughs> positivity or negativity. We'll talk about it more in detail but later, but actually the text of things, that's much more. Not, not just legal-wise, SEO-wise. That's what you definitely don't want to copy, even if you're going to replace the word free with gratis. You're not going to get away with changing a couple words of a paragraph. That's, that's very hard to get around compared to an image. So with text, definitely that's going to be all your original content. You're not going to repurpose other people's content for legal reasons and definitely for SEO reasons.
one of the reasons that this particular client has the fame and um, activity and traffic and such also is because they there's links coming from different entities um, there was recently a uh, Taste of LA event which was pretty amazing the owner took us up there we did their social media and such and we got so much great free food uh, and then there's a blog about it then there's a, a blog about um, Zagat, which is a, one of the most famous review sites in celebrities that I visit. This is the blog. This is another aspect that is important in modern SEO. We are writing content on our website that we update on a regular basis. The search engines put more preference on a site that is updated on a regular basis. So if you and your competitor both create a web design company on the same month, the same day, but you have been updating it and your competitor has not, the search engine will give you preference because your is, yours is more current. Well, that doesn't mean change the design every few months or change the home page text every week. That means content, updated content. Blogging is one of the best ways to create updated content. I teach a class on blogging where I go into all the details about it, but if you want to distill down to the most simplest term, you should be blogging as a beginner at least once a month. One new article every month. Length of the article, as a beginner, a hundred words is a good goal. That's the beginner, that's the lowest level. Higher levels are going to be once a week, 200 words. Because some of these sites that get so much traffic are updated three times a day, ten times a day. They have a stable of authors that create content five times a day, 500 words. Those are the sites that are going to get the much more traffic. That's a very high bar. So as a beginner, once a month, 100 words is a very good starting point. Question? Um, there used to be all the time it still is. Exactly. No, I, I hear the opposite. Content was king, content is king, content will be king. Because various SEO techniques change. It's a moving target. But it's always about content. I'm trying to find something. I'm trying to find a great Mexican food restaurant. That's not going to change. The web design of it may change and the tags and such may change but the content of it is still these great pictures or text or accolades and such. So the search engines are still going to put a lot of preference, precedence on content. So that's not, that's not going to go away unless there's a radical shift. But it's, I think it's really, really in it for the long term because again, it used to be, well, you just need to find your, your keywords, web design, and I'm going to put it everywhere on my site. Well, so did the spammers. But I have this original content that I'm posting, and yes, the spammers can scan, uh, can steal my, my content and put it on their own website. That exists also, but the search engines are getting smarter to figure out the original content from the copied content. That's why I'm saying we're not going to copy other people's content, and so content is king. Content on a regular basis that helps to rank you. Uh, the blogging class goes on into detail about how to blog, what to blog, why to blog, etc. But this is another example to get some ideas. The, the recent blog posts have been a bit self-promotional. That doesn't hurt because then that helps you get found. But another aspect of this particular site's blog is for education. This is a Mexican food restaurant. Traditional Mexican lamb barbecue. Barbacoa de Borrego. It's traditional Mexico City style from a town near Mexico City called Texcoco. Aquí es Texcoco. This is Texcoco. It's the style of food of that place. And so the blog helps educate you on the food because you're not going to find nachos, you're not going to find California burritos, carne asada burritos, and that sort of thing. You're going to find this traditional food. Um, here, for example, there's this beverage, pulque. How many of you have heard of pulque before? If you have it, read this blog and you'll get educated. Basically, it's an alcoholic beverage made out of the maguey plant. The maguey plant is one of the seasonings to this food. So, uh, how many of you have heard of the agave plant? What does that graduate into? Tequila. Tequila. 
pulque graduates to, or maguey plants graduate to pulque. And this restaurant is one of the few restaurants in the county that sells authentic pulque. You can buy pulque in various liquor stores and such, but it's pasteurized. It has to be pasteurized to be bottled, which kills some of the flavor and the such. And here is the, is the most pure version of it that's sold at the restaurant. Maybe it sounds interesting. Maybe you read this blog post, get educated, get thirsty, and you're nearby. I'm going to go buy a glass. So it's flavored in different ways. It could be straight up or flavored. They're all pretty good. They're, it's okay. a very... Okay. That article about that, you can, suppose I, in, I, in my website, I have something, a blog or so, and one of the blogs is cooking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I want to I copy the recipe from another place and I put it there. It's okay. Notice, this is why I give the example of the site. There's links back to the original. So we're not copying word for word. But this means takes you to other places where there are the recipes. Yes. But all that text that you have there that is describing how to do that beverage, I suppose, huh? is like you write it or you can copy that? No, I would still create it original. As much as possible, you're writing it yourself. Maybe that recipe is a hundred-year-old recipe, sure, and you can write it there, but you're still going to be writing extra words, your own words, in your own words, about that recipe. Changing a little of the, whatever you find in another place, maybe? We'll be, again, let's be careful. This particular blog post, for example, it's all original content with some links to other people's sites. If it was a recipe and such, you're still going to write your own text about the recipe and you can have a link back to the original website's recipe. That's okay. good. If you just copy the original recipe, maybe change a couple of words and link it back, that's not so good. It's so similar to the original text. You still want original text. This particular blog post has links embedded within the text and also sort of like little references. That's that's a way, that's one way to do it. This one over here also. Here's one about the craft beers they sell. Here's one of lamb barbecue, barbacoa style. Again, there's a photo, there's a teaser text, there's the full text. Um, there's ways also to share. There's related posts. All of this we cover in the blogging class. But there's links from one thing to another thing within our site, keeping them on the site. There's a way for them to share the posts. This one over here, you know, about these craft beers that are served at the restaurant. Um, it's been shared. Look at that, 191 shares on Facebook. That's getting you traffic. This post on the website, we shared it on our Facebook, but other people also shared it and reshared it, and it spread to more people, and that has the link back to the original blog post, more traffic back to the website. I don't understand what they share in the Facebook. It's like people that look at that in the website, or what? Basically, when you share something on any social network, a link is placed on Facebook back to this original post. So someone read this and publish that in, page, in their own pages? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, Shared it from their Facebook or their Twitter or their Google Plus to their friends. So now their friends will see this, not the whole thing, a link back to the thing to read it. And then once they say, oh, you guys have Hans Omer, let me go to the restaurant or let me order online. So it comes from those uh, items that you have uh, in there? That's two different things. This one are this is the Twitter account of this restaurant. Oh, okay. But down here is if I have Twitter, I'm going to put it on my Twitter. I click that one. So again, on your website, the ability for people to share your stuff to their profiles. That's valuable SEO, valuable SEM aspect of things. So blogging, social media, pictures and text, original. Um, a good website design that, that, that works well, that is not confusing for people, which can be hard. 
that's also valuable for SEO and like I said being mobile friendly if your website looks good also on a mobile device the search engines like that a lot uh, because more and more traffic to websites is coming from a mobile device so if you don't know if your website is mobile one way to check this it's not the most accurate way but one way is if you resize your web browser you see when it's that wide see how it looks when I make it smaller it kind of shrinks and look at how it changed the menu no longer stands out like that it's a drop-down and then when you're at a certain point even even smaller you know it it's, it conforms to the size of your screen so resizing your web browser is a quick way to check if it's mobile friendly it's not the most accurate way, however. The accurate way is to look at it on a mobile device. Uh, if you're a little bit more advanced and, and you know how to use the developer tools of a, of, a, of a web browser, you can usually have the mobile, the mobile checker. Here I'm checking it on an iPhone 6. And it did conform to it, so it is mobile friendly. If it wasn't mobile friendly, it would be cutting off. Yes, this picture is cutting off a little bit, but uh, the other stuff has been rearranged. What I mean by cutting off is literally you're visiting the site on a mobile device and like half the things are off. The text and everything is off the edge. That's not mobile friendly. Have you visited a site on your mobile that the text is so small that you have to zoom into it? Most likely, it's not mobile friendly either. A good mobile-friendly site, the text will be nice and readable even on a small screen. You won't need to zoom in. It conforms to the size of the screen. That's a signal that the search engines look at now. Is your, is your website mobile-friendly? And WordPress, many of the modern software, can make your site mobile-friendly very easily. Yes? Uh, I'm using Google Chrome, and then I pressed F12 to bring my developer tools, and then I activated up here the developer tool emulator. It's a little advanced. Um, I can show you during the break. Uh, let's look at another example. Client. We seem to get restaurants sometimes. That Italian food one. Again, um, I don't have to remember the address because it's at the top. Um, but another WordPress site, a different kind of style. Still focus on pictures because people like pictures, especially food pictures. Um, menu items to easily navigate the site. Logo, search box if necessary. This one's got Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. They're on Yelp. They're on uh, TripAdvisor, right on the home page, phone number and such, hours of operation, we'll look at the menu, uh, depending on your business, this doesn't apply to everyone, but depending on your business, like a restaurant, it's better to have a menu that is regular text than a picture. It's very easy to add pictures to a website, especially let's say the picture of my menu. But you're doing yourself a disservice because the search engines, as smart as they are and as advanced as they are, they can't quite deal with pictures as well as text. The search engine can easily understand this. It's text. It has every word in the dictionary program so it can understand those words. If this was a picture simply of the Bruschetta Toscana, it wouldn't really know what it is. It might say this is a plate of food. It wouldn't know that it's an appetizer or this particular advertiser. Think about this as a, it's a picture of people. The search engine says it's people. There's a few men and women there. That's it. Well that was a picture of the team of our business. There, John was there, and Janet was there, and Bill was there. The search engine is not smart enough to know that. So as much as possible, you're going to add text content to your website rather than picture content. I'm not saying avoid pictures, but I'm saying when it makes sense, add text instead of pictures. An old technique of web design was, I want this text up here to look nice. I want a cool font. 
And in the old style of web design, I would go to Photoshop, design that picture, save it, and then put it on my site. We don't do that anymore on modern websites. Because again, the search engines understand text better than pictures. And we have the ability nowadays to add cool fonts to our sites, finally. I've been involved in web design for over a decade and um, more than that, and um, I've seen it coming and going that people would make cool graphics of their text. We don't do that anymore because the search engines don't understand it as well. Why make the, why make the job hard for the search engines? They're helping us get traffic. Yes. So if you were creating a portfolio, would you add text to the images that you're posting? Exactly. As like a brief description, just so that if somebody was searching a, I don't know, a logo as opposed to like something else, some other graphic design, then it would be able to pick up the variations of what you have on your site. Yes, when we get to it, we'll talk about the importance of alt text. So you definitely want to add alt text to your pictures. It's also useful to add caption text, which is just text that's visible below the picture. Yes, that helps the search engine because, you know, these might be great pictures and we can all see them and appreciate them, but the search engine is not going to understand that that is the patio of the restaurant where you can be surrounded by Luciano Pavarotti and uh, other famous Italian-Americans or Italians. So you do want to add text in addition to your graphics. That's a little bit. Uh, that's a little bit more for the people. That when someone puts their mouse over a picture and that appears, that's more for people. That's called the title. The title text. There's another one called alt text, which is more valuable. That one might not be visible. To people, uh, but it's very valuable to the search engines. And when we do this and talk about how to do that, I'll explain that alt text is much more recommended than title text. But you can do alt text and title text, because title text is what pops up here for people. That's valuable for people. But what's also valuable is the is the alt text. Um, let's look at one more then we'll take a break this is another kind of client this is Elsa Valencia dot com she is an independent jewelry designer she has her own studio forges her own gold jewelry and sells it online there's this website um, it's really nice it's really nice jewelry but then when uh, when you're ready to click the buy button, you might be deterred. Um, but she also has a blog. She has a blog here about her process, about her experience, about her pieces. That's answering the why. Honestly, this is expensive jewelry, but there are people that love this jewelry and buy it. And she's she's up and coming, she's getting good fame. She's actually some of her pieces are going to be featured in a in a uh, in an article on Vogue magazine Mexico soon. So she's going to be getting even more publicity. But she's very active on Instagram. She's a superstar on Instagram. She gets a lot of views, a lot of likes, a lot of traffic from Instagram. You can't sell anything on Instagram. You can click like as much as you want, but you can't buy on Instagram. You can buy. She can buy. She can sell on her site. That's why you still want a website, even if you're only going to be, even if you think that you only need social media, you still need a website most likely to sell your product, to get subscribers, to get your donations, to get whatever it is you're trying to do online, to get your portfolio out there. You might be able to put variations of your portfolio on Twitter, but really your whole portfolio its completeness and such and hopefully what gets you hired or contacted is on your site. So she's got a blog. She writes this one herself. Um, but we set up the e-commerce and the design and such. And so she's writing about this particular piece. A lot of photos to get you interested to, uh, to buy it and then you, know, you can read more and then you can further forge a connection um, with the pieces and then you can you can buy it 
Uh, now, since we're working with her mostly on the technical aspect, and she's doing, of course, the pieces and the writing and such, um, we need to remind her, remember to put a link in the blog directly to go buy that piece. I don't think she put it on the latest one, but maybe I'm loving this, so I want to gift it or whatever, and then I want to click buy. So then it would take me over to the shop, and then you'll see the pieces there, and then go through the process right there. You select an option, ring size, and all of that, and you buy. So this is another WordPress site. It's got a different style, very clean, very modern, sparse, but elegant. It's mobile friendly. If you look at it on a mobile device, it also conforms to the mobile device. Notice how the menu has changed like that. Everything is much more digestible, very readable on the mobile. You can um, go through the whole process, create a wish list, etc. There's social media. Someone might visit this piece and really like it and want to tell their friends about it. They can email that to their friends. They can post it on Pinterest. Pinterest is a very valuable social network also. If you take the social media class, we, we talk about Pinterest and every social network has its own demographic and who uses it most. Studies show at the moment Pinterest is very popular with women. And so she's trying to reach a female audience, so she has an easy way for people to share on Pinterest. And then getting her traffic and getting sales. Instagram is a little trickier because it, to post to Instagram, you have to do it through the app on the device. Uh, and right now, Instagram really, they, they've kind of made it a bit of a monopoly. The only way you can really post to Instagram is through the Instagram app. Some of these other networks are more open, that you can post to them easily. Instagram, you can't. You can, um, but again, it's a little more complicated than these other networks. So those are a few clients. You can further see other clients and other things about our company over at pmdinteractive.com. You can check that out on your own. We're going to take our last break, uh, and then after the break we'll have one more activity, then we'll wrap up the day, have a little lab time, and then we'll further go on with these concepts. Uh, next time, remember, bring your password. But let's take a break. It's 8.30-ish. We'll take a break until 8.40 when we come back. We'll have one more handout, one more activity.